But still, uh, I would pass on that. Oh, not that Steveland is not worthy of a good romp in a bed. I'm just saying he's 16 and she a grown woman, you know, with him crawling all on her. Uh. <laughs> Hello there, Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share the Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com for these JT Rizza shades. Now, keep in mind, I am back in the DMV temporarily, so your order will not be sent out until uh i want to say the first week in august okay uh i do apologize for that but i still gotta make my money while i'm out of town so please show me mercy and give me grace in regards to shipping got these and of course the black and the brown and if you are not already a part of of this book club please hit the patreon link below and or the join button here on the youtube and for a small monthly fee of five dollars you babies yes yo can be privy to all the shenanigans before the youtube gets it if the youtube gets it now child let's continue to talk about missy ma'am favorite place to work back home. I love this park. I do. I find so much solace in this park. But let's continue talking about Miss Betty Levette. A woman like me. Clarence Paul sent me a ticket to go home to Detroit. During that visit, Clarence had an idea for a party that he wanted to host in my blue basement bedroom. Stevie Wonder was turning 16 and Clarence was convinced it was time the boy became a man. Who did I think was the right woman? He deserves the best, I said. I'm not volunteering you, said Clarence. I'm not worthy of that honor. Marie Early is. That's an honor to sleep with Stevie De Wonder? Steveland? Little Steveland Wonder? Girl, uh, uh, okay. Let's see how this turns out. If you want to initiate Steve in an unforgettable way, you need Marie. There could be no more beautiful birthday gift than Marie Early. Girl, you think that lady want to phone a teenager? Are you crazy? Especially Hansy Steveland? I mean, well... I mean, well, I mean, if she do it to him right, then that mother could be sending the whole paycheck to her. But still, uh, I would pass on that. You know, not that Stevelyn is not worthy of a good romp in a bed. I'm just saying he's 16 and she a grown woman, you know, with him crawling all on her. Uh, Can't uh. argue with that, said Clarence. I'll call her. I got the food and drinks. The friends and the music. I decorated my basement with balloons. When Stevie arrived with Clarence, he walked down the stairs to the basement and bumped his head on the low ceiling. He was excited. Clarence might have told him about the special gift that awaited him. We had a blast, but sadly, Marie never arrived. Yeah, she probably was like, okay, okay. And then did something else. The hell? No. She probably was tossing and turning the whole night before. I did. Steve Lynn? A 16-year-old Steve Lynn. Smokey then told everybody that he is annoying. If I sleep with this little boy real good, he is going to be on my motherfucking line forever. No. No, girl. No. Shit. I know she was eager to do the honors. But something else more pressing must have come up, like her peace of mind. That's what the hell was more pressing, her peace of mind. Did you hear what Smokey Robinson said? And he would smell you when you was coming through the door? 
Could you imagine what the rest of that lady's life would be? Do you know that Stevie Wonder, Stevelyn Wonder has about 37 children now? She wouldn't be able to beat her way with a stick. She would have to buy Stevelyn Wonder repellent to keep that ninja away from her. Are you crazy? We were all disappointed and no one more than Stevie. Y'all act like y'all was going to watch it happen. Ugh, I am grossed out. Back in New York, my life was anchored by my gig at Small's Paradise with Don and Dee Dee. Dee Dee was also my buddy. One day, we were riding around the city when two guys in a convertible pulled up beside us. We started flirting, and one thing led to another. I went off with one of the guys a big time drug dealer. Although he already had a wife and a girlfriend, he took a liking to me and vice versa. Meanwhile, Dee Dee's romantic fortunes continued to decline. She fell into a deep depression. There was a period when I was working an out of town gig and gave her my clothes for safekeeping. At the time, she was staying with Margaret Mays, Willie May's ex-wife on Long Island, but poor Dee Dee. The blues got the best of her and she burned down the place. All my clothes along with most everything else went up in smoke. My new boyfriend was good enough to replace them. He obviously took our relationship seriously because when he caught me with another man, he cut up all the clothes he had bought me including six pair of shoes. I had never seen anyone cut up shoes before. When I asked him why, given that he had a wife and a mistress in addition to me, he would feel so betrayed. He was too angry to answer. Well, if I thought this guy was obsessive and possessive when it came to women, I hadn't seen anything yet. The next man to enter my life was in a category of his own. It astounds me that I succumbed to a mother trigger like Jay. The name I'm giving the man you met at the beginning of this book, he represented the end of my venture in New York City. He also represented one of the low points of my life. How in the world did it happen? I was singing at Smalls, as Stevie would later say, I was living for the city. I found a way to survive. I even had a little following. My second single, for the gangsters at Kalia, only your love can save me didn't save me at all. Although it was written by Joe Armstead, along with the team of Nick Ashford and Valerie Simpson on the verge of writing smashes for Marvin and Tammy, the single sank like a lead balloon. My only income was a slim salary and the occasional tip from a drunk at the bar. When I met Jay, you could say I was vulnerable. But when it came to falling head over heels, I've always been vulnerable. In my defense, the man was magnificent. Good looks in a man have often blinded me to his character. When I'd seen a handsome guy showing interest in me, his stares of appreciation killed off my brain cells. All powers of scrutiny collapsed. Later, I learned that Jay had spent 10 years in prison, but on the night we met, I saw not the slightest hint of criminality in his deep brown eyes. All I saw was sweetness and light. He dressed with the same sophistication as Ted White did. His speaking voice had the honey-coated tones of a midnight disc jockey, and there was this irresistibility of his high-toned culture. So I believe at this time, because she said it when she crossed paths with the dude Luther, that she was looking for this guy Jay to be to her what Ted White was to Aretha. Okay. And I think she just fell desperate in that moment. I learned from an older woman when I was younger. Don't be so desperate to get in something that you pick up trash, you know? So being in that position of vulnerability and disparity will put you with trash. In my mind, my messed up mind, I was thinking, well, 
At least I'm over Clarence Paul. It took a mighty man like Jay to finally get me to fall in love with someone other than Clarence. But my thinking was wildly distorted. The distoration deepened when I took Jay home to meet Mama. When she took the man home to meet Mother, he was so smooth. You hear me? That the Mama and the sister liked the Mother. Unlike in the movie Sparkle, remember when Sister took Satin Struthers home? And Mary Alice was like, girl, he gonna drag you to the gutter. And that's just what he did. Because Sister came fly with one wing. For me right. to withdraw from my world of music and friends was an amazing thing. I'm a musical animal. I'm a social animal. I like to party. I like to hang at the clubs. I like to go out. Ain't no going out unless you're going out for me or with me, said Jay. Going out for me. For me. For me. Soon he was asking me, do you think you were smart before you met me? Yes, I said. The hell you were. You were dumb. And with that, he slapped me across the face. Who was he to talk to me like that? And who was I to accept that treatment? What was in my mind? What was in my heart? Jay had a hooker. I'll call her Helen. She was his main earner. A stunning woman who worked with remarkable efficiency. She had perfected the art of turning tricks. She attracted men with money. So refined were her techniques that her tips were sometimes as big as her fees. Imagine the pleasure a man must feel to voluntarily double the fee he pays for sex. Helen would often be in the Amsterdam Avenue apartment where I was living with Jay. She cooked enslaved over the man to a sickening degree. One evening, Helen spent hours cooking Jay a five-course dinner. When he sat down to eat, she sat next to him and as though he were a child, cut up his food and with her fork put it in his mouth. I laughed out loud. That is some funny shit, I said. That is some ridiculous shit. Jay got up from the table, whacked me across my mouth, and snarled. Shut up, bitch. No one asked you nothing. And looking back at this sad period of my life, I can't help but ask myself what took me so long to leave this man when he stopped me from seeing my friends or singing in public. Why didn't I tell him to go screw himself after he ordered me out on the streets to turn tricks and told me not to come back until I earned a hundred dollars a day? Why did I continue to do his bidding for another two or three months? Okay, so pause. This is what I'm going to say. Let me take my uh, shades off, okay, so I can look you people in the face. You know, what happens is in life is that you just get caught up in a situation. Everybody has a moment in life where they don't even recognize themselves. And it was because you were vulnerable in that moment. And a predator found you. And because you feel vulnerable, depressed, dejected, and alone, like nobody else understands you, and then the predator turns into a prince. And what happens is, although this predator is doing predatorial things to you, on you, with you, for you, you still don't see them for who they are. All you know is that that predator is there for you in that vulnerable moment. Moment, And they take advantage. And it's not until you realize, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Until your strength starts to grow that you get it. You can't you know. beat yourself up for the mistakes that you have made along the way or the bad decisions that you have made along the way. The only thing you can do is grow from it, okay? Me, when I fuck up, I mean, when I hit rock bottom, I'm learning, earning, and growing from that situation. 
you know, and luckily I got some supporters that got my back. I cannot lie. I have my situations, you know, I'm not going to lie. I thought something was going to be, ah, 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 and it turned it out to be, eh, 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 you know, but I can't sit there and just wallow in it. I got to move forward. I got to face the bad mistakes and I got to move forward. Okay. And I advise all my supporters and all my listeners to do the same. How long you going to wallow in that despair? You can make it. It's scary, but you can do it. Why did I continue to do his bidding for another two or three months? Because you wasn't ready. It's okay. It's okay. Now let me put my JT Rizzo shades back on because I'm feeling real smooth right now with this new cut. I was a great groupie, but a horrible hooker. My judgment was bad. My approach inept. My hustle pathetic. I only survived because of the kindness of Frank Cassian, who would give me a hundred dollars from time to time. King Curtis helped me out. So did Don Gardner. Other musicians who started making money as pimps felt sorry for me and gave me enough to placate Jay. Then one day I ran into Luther Dixon. Well, okay, hold on. This part I'm a little confused about because I'm like, are you screwing them? Because if you're screwing them, it's not giving, okay? I mean, I mean, if you want to call it a donation, you can call it a donation. But if you're screwing the dudes, it's not, it's, they not giving it to you, baby. Then one day I ran into Luther Dixon. Betty, he said, you look tired, baby. I am. What are you up to? For whatever reasons, I told him the truth. The words just spilled out of my mouth. I'm working for Jay, I say. Lord have mercy. Luther sympathized. That man's a monster, i.e. Gorilla Pimp. Mm -hmm. How much you got to give him to keep from getting beat? A hundred dollars a day? He has a hundred just because I don't want to see you hurt. He put the money in my hand and went on his way. Okay, okay, okay. Now, okay, I'll keep going. An hour later, I put the money in Jay's hand. When I couldn't make my daily quota, sometimes I'd steal it from Helen. She was earning so much she never knew the difference. When I walked past a record shop or turned on the radio, I'd hear hit after hit coming out of Detroit. There were friends of mine, people I'd grown up with. Reach out, I'll be there. What becomes of the brokenhearted? My world is empty without you. My world was empty with Jay. My world was hell. Better men came through for me. Clarence Paul and Ted White would always wire me a hundred bucks so I could avoid another beating. But can you imagine how incredibly stupid I felt getting money from these guys so I could placate this raging asshole of a pimp? Mm, 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 mm. Where my water so I could take a drink on it? Because I get it. Thank you, Miss Batty, for telling us your truth. Because a, a lot of bitches wouldn't do it. I thought about the last two songs I'd recorded for Kala. The A-side was I'm Just a Fool for You. Was there ever a more fitting title to describe my ridiculous situation with Jay? The B-side was Stand Up Like a Man. It was when I was listening to that single that I finally saw the light. Enough was enough. I had to stand up like a woman. I can't tell you where the strength came from. It was not a religious epiphany. I didn't hear angels singing on high. I didn't hear the voice of God. All I heard were two words coming from my mouth to Jay's ears that should have been spoken months before. F you. Okay. I said that to his face. I told him I was going and there was nothing he could say to change my mind. That's when he that. grabbed me and hung me over the edge of the building. That's when I wiggled my way out of the perilous moment by calling his bluff. That's when he let me go. And taking no chances, that's when I ran out leaving all of my worldly possessions with him. I was on the streets. A shoeless 20 year old broke and scared to death. Oh, yeah. you see that